So, uh, Matthew 24, verse 3. We will start reading from verse 3 to verse 8. This way. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, This is Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. For many will come in my name, say, oh, verse 5 and then verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines. And then the ESV translation left out something. I it up this week. When I, who, who knows? Pestilence. It's not there. So I did put it, did I put it in? Yes, that's not in the ESV. Pestilence is not there, so I don't know why. <laughs> Got no reason why, but anyways. Um, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places are but the beginning of birth pains. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful time just to, to worship you and come before your throne this morning and just uh, submit our lives to you. Thank you for knowing that you are for us and not against us. You saved us by your son Jesus Christ who died on the cross and made it possible for us to come into your presence this morning. And I thank you Lord that we can also um, learn and read from your word and may your word be profound in our lives and may it be not just words and knowledge but wisdom and also things that we can apply and thank you Lord that we can just open our hearts this morning and just ask that the Holy Spirit will, will teach us, illuminate our minds this morning. We ask this in your wonderful name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now it's been a um, <clears throat> journey so far in Matthew 24 for you have been, some of you have been following it from the beginning, some of you have been missing some sermons but that's fine, I forgive you. <laughs> but I hope you can pick up where we kind of left last time and uh, maybe just start to say that um, Hollywood, we all know Hollywood, today there's a Bollywood also, something like that, but Hollywood made a lot of movies about the end of the world, you've probably seen some of them and um, if it's not an asteroid who's going to destroy the planet or maybe an earthquake or a tsunami or anything, maybe a kind of a virus is going to wipe out the entire human race. Um, one thing that I find that is common in all of these movies, and I actually Google, there's so many, I can't actually, I, want, I don't want to try and start from the 1940s, they already had movies. Um, but one thing that is common in all of them is fear. The word fear. The world lives in fear when it approaches the subject of the end of the world. Now many people, including some believers, are anxious about the coming of the end. But we as believers don't have to be afraid because God is with us. Do you believe that? Say to the person next to you, I believe that, Pastor. God is is with us. I just want to get them awake, Dirk. Uh, <laughs> um, he, I don't normally do that for the visitors, don't worry. <laughs> but God promised that He will never leave us nor forsake us. Will our faith be tried and tested? Of course, our faith will be tried. But we don't have to be afraid. Now, Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Do you trust in the Lord this morning? Christians, however, do not be, you're not afraid, but we look forward to that great joy when Jesus comes 
and receive us unto Himself. The book of Revelation, for some of you, might be a very intimidating book, but the book of Revelation was never written to, to create fear and, and confusion. It was ris- uh, written to give hope to you and me as a believer. It's a book of hope. Now, it is our duty as believers to communicate that hope to a dying world, a world that we see when we see the world is falling apart. It is our duty to tell them why the world is falling apart, why it is happening, and that, um, um, uh, why this is going on, and to show them the hope that we have and the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. And also the signs of the times that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24 were not given, and this is important, wasn't given for us to try and figure out when the Lord is coming. It wasn't given so that we can try and figure out, and I think so many preachers and so many people over the years tried to do that and they were all mistaken. Jesus gave the signs of the times to us to tell us how things will be before He comes, but specifically how we should live as Christians until He comes. He tells us that judgment is coming and that we should be stewards of what He has given us. Remember, God gave us the Word not merely to inform us, but to transform us. The word is given, the message is meant to change our lives, not just to fill our heads. So important that we approach the study of something like this, the end of, uh, signs of the end times, that we approach it, Lord, change me, transform my life. Now, some of you might have heard about A.W. Tozer, very uh, prominent Christian writer and preacher and he wrote the following when he talks about bible prophecy he says the point of bible prophecy isn't to alarm us but to alert us to the circumstances leading up to the lord's return this alertness spurs us on to be ready and the bible says a lot on how to be ready for his return that's the purpose that's why we look at those things so that we are ready so that we are prepared when the Lord Jesus comes. Now, I want to quickly just summarize, go back to our diagram, maybe just to remind you of some of the things we said before. And this is just a, a diagram that I put up for myself also to, to, to not get confused when it comes to the signs in Matthew 24. Now, verse 4 to 6, if you can quickly remember, we said from verse 4, to verse 26 are the signs of the end, uh, the times that Jesus gives us in, here in Matthew. And we divided it in two groups, the general signs from 4 to 14, and I'll explain why, and then from 15 to 26, the specific signs that we know is uh, the coming of the Lord. And then verse 27 to 31 explains the coming of the Lord as the lightning from as he says for the Weerlagsland in the Oost and the West, the die fair. Okay, um, then also we talked about the times of the Gentiles. Can you remember that? Okay, kom ons begin weer. Drie weke terug. Now, and you can also, sorry, you can also compare that with Revelation 19 if you want to. Now the general signs is what we said took place in all of history. Since Jesus said these are the signs and He ascended to heaven, until He comes, those general signs will always be there. And this is when, when Jesus said, when He said, when you see these things, do not be alarmed. It's not the end. And we get so kind of... Uh, because we see wars and famines and pestilences. Oh, the Lord is coming. It's the end of the world. Jesus said, hey... Do not be led astray. It's not the end. It's just the beginning of sorrows. Do you remember that? It's not the end yet. And then we have the specific signs, verse 15, to, which is specifically for, um, mentioned, uh, so that when we see these things, we know it's the end. Now, um, 
Let me just explain this in quick. And I know this is a controversial subject, especially in Christian circles. There are many different views. And I, I don't want to deal with each one of them and tell you why they believe this and they believe this and they believe this because I want to concentrate specifically on our text, Matthew 24, and how we understand this. So it's just necessary that I show you this. Now, there's, there, there are, main, let's say, mainly three groups, but I'm going to, um, uh, let's say, past, present, or future, if you want to see it this way. Some believe that all the signs, some believe from this all the signs that Jesus gave from verse 4 to the end, they've all in the past. They've all been fulfilled. And that is what we call preterism. Okay, so you will probably have come across some people who believed everything. Some are on moderate that says, okay, Jesus didn't come, but most of the signs are already fulfilled. And a full preterist believe everything fulfilled 70 after Christ with the destruction of the temple. And you know why they do that? Is because they merged the three questions that the disciples asked. Remember those three questions? When will these things be? When will the temple be destroyed? What is the sign of your coming and, what, uh, and the sign of the end of the age? Can you remember those? Now they merged these, those things. They, they put it in one period of time and that's why they believe all of them have been fulfilled in the past. That's preterism. There are also those who believe that all the signs that we find from verse 4 up to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, the coming of the Lord belongs to the, the Great Tribulation. Have you heard of that before? The Great Tribulation, the seven-year period. I once was in that category. I believed that once. I changed my view on that, and I'll say to you why. They believe all of this is future. must happen in the Tribulation period. Okay? Now, then the third group of, okay, let me just say this. Those who believe put it all into the future is called futurism. Have you heard of that before? Futurism. And for those who know some of the preachers and um, very popular ones, John MacArthur, if I need to have a Bible, he falls into that category. He views all the signs as future in the tribulation. Now, I once did, but there's a reason why I don't anymore, is the third group places those signs over a period of time between Jesus' ascension and His return. And he, in this understanding says there is a distinction that we make between the general signs and the specific signs. General signs are those things that are spanned over time we see them happily, happening, happening all the time, but it will reach its climax in the great tribulation time. There will be a climax over time and then end into the climax. Now, for example, if, you can, if I can give you the example, the earthquakes. We're going to talk about earthquakes this morning as well. Earthquakes has always been there. And earthquakes will always be there. It's a general sign. But it doesn't signify the coming of the Lord. So if there's an earthquake, Jesus says, it's not the end yet. It's just the beginning of sorrows. That's why I don't view them all as future. And, 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 um, but in the time of the great tribulation, we will find, and I'm going to read this this morning, the greatest, the largest earthquake that the earth will ever get. It's the climax. Now, just to understand this, this is, this is why I'm going to refer to, make it my first point as well, the, is verse 8. So if you want to go to verse 8, it's the key of understanding this as well. Now, the key is verse 8 that says, All these things are but the beginning of birth pains. Now, the King James says, sorrows. And the Greek word... The, specifically refers to labor pains. Okay? All these things that Jesus mentions, specifically referring to the first five signs that we, we're going to look at today as well, the false Christ, wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, all these things that are included until verse 14 are the general signs, and the Greek word says sorrow, is Odin. I think I put it up there. Odin. Okay. Odin means labor pains. Labor pains. And just as 
it is true in labor pains, these signs will become more frequent and they will become more intense. Those who gave birth know what I'm talking about. Manne jylle verstaan nie. Ok? When the contractions begin, there are periods of relative rest in between. It's not like the Hollywood movie, young people, where they just, It doesn't work like that. There's contractions and it's over a period, okay? And then the birth pains don't stop until the baby is born. It doesn't stop. So, um, so are the signs of the times and if we understand it this way, the signs will be there, there are general signs, but they will increase and they will reach a climax when, before Jesus comes. And that's how I view it. It's, it's, it's general signs, but increasing and there will be a climax just before Jesus comes, specifically in the great tribulation period before Jesus comes. Now, um, before Jesus the Son of Man appears in person to bring the kingdom that was rejected when He first came, the intensity and the conditions will be far worse and more startling than ever. And you can just read Re a Revelation and you it's like a horror movie. Okay, It's like Hollywood on steroids, if you read that. And it will reach a climax uh, before Jesus comes. When, when Jesus comes, He will... In, augurate the new age and his reign now it makes more sense to me and if you don't agree that's fine i still love you i said this is not a salvation issue if this is an in-house debate we're not supposed in the church to say if you don't believe me you are not saved that's wrong it's fine if you want to be a preterist it's fine if you want to be a futurist it's fine we we, we are still brothers and sisters in christ and um, uh, uh, and I know between obviously between that, if I can go back, there are many many moderate views that overlap. Some people believe the the tribulation period starts here at verse eight. Um, Warfoot, Warfoot, I don't know how to it. A writer, um, H. A. Ironside believes it starts here at verse 15, the great tribulations. And I don't want to get technical because Jesus didn't have that in mind. Jesus was, wasn't trying to tell us when these things are going to, to happen. He was trying to say, when they happen, this is how you respond. This is how you should react. Now, to come back to um, what we have done last week specifically, I know we already spoke about false Christ, and I just mentioned a few, um, I think we'll, we'll just keep, and I don't want to go into much, because false Christ, there's so many things. There's, we can have a whole series just on deception, specifically in our own day, and what's going on in the church specifically. Um, but I think I don't want to wander off too much from our text this morning. So let's go to the second one, and that is wars and rumors of wars. Verse 6 says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now we know that there have been many wars in the past few thousand years, but specifically in the last century we had two world wars. Okay, World War I, World War II. And you know what? It came, it passed, and uh, the end was still not yet. Was Jesus right? It, of course, he's always right. It's always not like a mooi luister nie. And maybe people should just listen what Jesus said. And stop listening to these guys when, when there are wars. And You know the, how many books was written after World War I about the end of the, the world? After World War II, how many books were written about the end of the world? And, and people just get... And I think people are, are looking, looking to some Messiah or Savior to come and uh, fix this mess of this world. And, um, but Jesus said, do not be alarmed, it's not the end. 
And even when we hear of wars and rumors of wars, we must not be troubled. Until Jesus comes, there will always be wars. Now, I'm just thinking about a scripture that says when people say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come. Why? Because there will not be peace and safety until Jesus comes. Man do not have the ability in himself to solve this problem of peace, of, of, of wars. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. And we need to know this. Now verse 7 starts with the word for. And that word for is the word gar, G-A-R, G -A -R, and it, this expresses a reason or explanation of the previous statement. So it says, um, all these things you will hear of wars and rumors of wars for the nation. The explanation why there will be wars and rumors of wars is because nations will rise against nations. Kingdoms against kingdoms. Now the Greek word for nation is the word in Greek ethnos. It comes from the word, uh, you, you know, all the, know the word ethnic, okay? People, it's a, a group of, eth, of a certain kind of ethnicity. Ethne? Okay, yeah, die, die word, okay. It's a common word. So why do you think different ethnic groups are fighting all the time? Jesus said it's going to be like that. And um, the word for kingdom against kingdom is the word basileia. Now kingdom is, a, is the territory ruled over by a king. The area that a king is ruling over. Now when, when Jesus said that, that it, this, what he, what, he, what he was referring to is a kingdom are those different ethnic groups of people that are um, in... But see, allegiance with one another. And they fight against other different groups of people. Unions and countries fighting one another. So the problem starts with ethnic people fighting one another and then kingdoms fighting one another. And we can go on and on because why? Because the human heart is selfish. Even in our own country, you can just go and see See what's going on in the political arena. Why do they fight so much? Selfishness. I want. I want. It's what I want. And there will always be wars because humans are selfish. And as long as people want what they want and not what God wants, there will always be wars. And that's just a fact. And... Um, the, the next one is famine, pestilence, and earthquakes. I so just put it together, verse 7, and there will be famines, earthquakes in various places. Famines, the word limos, that simply means hunger. Okay, so famine, uh, when people die of hung, hunger, it's referred to as famine. And it will always, it has always been part of the human history, and it occurred in every generation especially after the world wars there were famine and pestilence and it has been the worst I, I, if i look at our last cent, uh, century the 20th century it has been the worst famine that the w humankind have ever experienced just think about increase birth pains now there's an increase and it's going to get worse especially when it reaches its climax in the tribulation period. And you can read about this in Revelation 6 and I'll refer to that. Revelation 6 verse 7 when he opened and this is talking about the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the four living creatures say come and I looked and behold a pale horse and its rider name was death and Hades followed him and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. The climax of the signs that Jesus gave in Matthew 24. Now I know if they, people read that, they say, okay, this must be the beginning of the tribulation, so that must be future. Can you see why they think that way? So I say, no, no, no. 
There's general signs, but it will reach the climax in Revelation. Pestilence. The King James has got it. The ESV somehow known unknown reason. I don't know why they left it out. I just discovered it this week. So last week, if you, you were very clever and alert, you would have told me. Maar jylle mense luister mos nie. Huh? Het jylle gekyk in die Bible? Who, who picked it up last week? Nobody. Oh. Okay. Um, pestilence. Very interesting to go and look in Google that. Okay. And I just put some of the most deadliest epidemics that the world has ever known was in the last two centuries. Okay. I've got some, and maybe Murray can help us a bit here if, if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's a good study here. Third cholera pandemic. Pandemic. Do you know about that? 18 cholera. For 1852 to 80, 1860. Two, 23,000 people were killed in Britain alone by this disease. We still have it today. The next one that I picked up was the Asian flu pandemic in 1957. I believe it must be look, look like that because that's Google told me. Now the estimated death for that. Um, ep epidemic was two, 2 million people 1957 2 million people died um, typhus fever what is typhus fever weet jy? world war 1 a disease that spread it was a disease and I actually read about it it was spread by lice Okay, and it killed over three million people in the world in World War One, especially in Russia, if I can remember. Now you probably know about the Spanish Spanish what the minute Spanish flu in 1918, the Great Flu epidemic, and this was recorded as the most devastating ep epidemic in history. Five hundred million people were affected. And almost 100 million people died because of that. We all know this one, HIV, AIDS. And it was, first, first time it was reported was in 1981. Since then, it has caused the death of 35 million people worldwide. Now, what concerns me, what concerns me, and I don't want to scare you. I don't want to alarm you. Jesus said, do not be alarmed when you see these things, but be alert. Is what they call today is the super bug. Have you heard about the super bug? Mari? You will praat van super bugs. Nee. Okay. Now, there's a super bug, and I read about this. this a, a super bug is a bacteria that, uh, that becomes resistant against any medic medication. And it's bacteria that resists anti antibiotics. Okay? Now, public health experts advise you not to overuse antibiotics um, or to use it the wrong way because it will reduce the effectiveness of that drug. And lately, there has been an explosion in resistant fungi. Betty van dit, Marie? C. Oris. Weet jy van die C. Oris? Okay. I read about this, and in fact, there are articles published a month ago, one of them in Talk Radio 702, that published an article about the deadly fungus that is found in our hospitals today. I'm not going to give you the numbers, because you might never want to go to a hospital if I say it. Now, it's called, can, it's called Candida Oris. Candida Oris. The, the short name is C. auris. Now, it's a fungi, and the risk of infection is relatively low, but the concern is that it is resistant to bio ant antibiotics. And mostly people with low um, immunity, like babies and old people, they pick it up in the hospitals. But the problem and the concern is it is evolving. And we, we, we are, we, and the whole medical practice, now I skit no nie for, for Marie, is doctor, is the antibiotics is creating the superbug. Am I right? 
because they're becoming, they want to survive the, the, the medication that we use. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you Jesus was right all along. And when this happened, we are not afraid. We are hopeful because we know that His coming is, is near. Although it's still not yet. It will be, uh, the climax will be in the Great tri Tribulation. Now, earthquakes, the word in Greek for earthquake is seismos, that literally means shaking or commotion. Now, it May mostly refer to shaking of a storm on a sea, or it in the New Testament it was used to refer to the shaking of ground, and we know that's what happens. Now, statistically, there are 500,000 earthquakes per year in the world, and only a hundred thousand is felt. They only we can only feel a hundred thousand. Now, we luckily in South Africa. I'm so glad I'm, I'm a South African. Because we're safe here, there's not so many, except for the mines that wants to create their own earthquakes. But the largest earthquake that was ever recorded was the Great Chilean earthquake in 1960, in 22 May. And the magnitude was 9.5 on the Richter scale. That was the largest one that was ever recorded. Two million people were left homeless. Now Jesus said... This is the beginning of sorrow, birth pains, labor pains. And the greatest earthquake that will ever happen is what we read in Revelation 16, the climax. And that is, and there, was, there were flashes of lightning, rumbles, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on earth. So great was the earthquake. Do you see the birth pains? The increase is getting, getting worse and worse. And that will be the climax. The world has never seen, will, has never seen something like that. Now, I wanna, don't want to go to, in too much history and details and things, but I just want to say that when Jesus said these words, when He spoke these words, the signs of the times in Matthew 24, just remember that the church was not born yet when was the church born who knows pentecost ah last one act 2 when the holy spirit was poured out and paul refers to that in 1 corinthians 12:13 he says and you have been baptized by the holy spirit into the body of christ we are all quenched by the Spirit. Meaning that the, 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 the church was born in Acts 2. In Matthew 24, the church is not the subject. And that's where people get confused. Although these are general signs, let me quickly go back to that diagram. All these, although these are general signs over the times of the Gentiles, the church is not mentioned here at all. Why? Because the church was not born yet. And because the church wasn't born, you will not find anything in Matthew 24 on the teaching of the rapture. Have you heard about the teaching of the rapture? It's a Latin word for being caught away. It's a biblical teaching. Thessalonians 4 talks about when Jesus comes, He will caught us up. Harpatsu in Greek. And that is where the word rapture comes from. But that is not mentioned here. Some people, like Ironside and, and um, Warford, I don't know, puts the rapture somewhere between verse 8 and 9. And no, that's a bit of, you don't know. We don't know. Because that's not the subject. That's not what Jesus is dealing with. Now, in fact, there, in fact, there is no signs that indicates the nearness of the rapture. Why? Because it's imminent. Jesus said, I will come like a thief. Nobody's going to know. Nobody will know that. Will we know when He comes 
Here, the Bible says, every eye will see Him. Will we know when He comes for His church? We won't know. There's no sign that indicates His return for His church. The first time this teaching was introduced was in John, verse, John chapter 14. I don't know if you knew this, and I've got it on there. John chapter 14 is the first time we've got the teaching or the idea of this. Is verse 1 that says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And then he says, verse 3, And I will go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and take you where I am. He will take you to Himself. And that will be when we will be with Him. That's the first time we have something that shows us that Jesus is coming for His bride, for His church. And this is what we are looking forward to as a church. I'm not afraid of all these signs and the climax of that because I know Jesus is coming for me. Can I get one amen, please? Do you believe that? I don't want to be alarmed because I've got a living hope in Christ. A hope of eternal life. And Jesus promised that He will take us to be with Him. Now if you believe it, it's before the tribulation, after, in the middle, or what. However you want to believe that, that's fine. You just know that Jesus is coming for you. And that's the truth. And I believe that. And I'm looking forward to that. Are you looking forward to that? If you're not sure, Jesus said, believe in God, believe in me. Put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ and He'll save you. He said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, you will be saved. And Jesus died on the cross so that you don't have to. Be with Him, without Him. Now the worst thing that can ever happen to any human being is not going to hell. It's the worst thing that can ever happen to you is to not be with Jesus one day. So that His back is turned against you forever for eternity. That's the worst thing that can be. Without God. So put your trust in Him and believe in Him. Confess your sins to Him and He will save you. Now, next time we'll, we'll continue with verse 9 to 14. Another more signs that also indicates that general signs, but we will go into that um, next week. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank You that You have gone to Your Father's house to prepare for us a place. And that you promised that one day you will come again and take us away to be with you forever. What a wonderful hope. What a wonderful promise to know that you have not left us alone, but you've given us also the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be the, the guarantee of that inheritance. And Lord, one day you will come and claim your property, what belongs to you, and take it with you. And thank you, Lord, that we can hold on to that, that we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. And as we see all these things happen in the world, we, do not, we are not alarmed, Lord. We, we know that God is with us, and God has given us His Spirit to be with us and to guide us and to lead us. And thank you, Lord, we can trust this morning in Your Word. I pray that these words will resound in our hearts. May we meditate on your word day and night so that we might, might not sin against you. Lord, as we know that your, your coming for us is imminent, that we will every moment of the day be ready and prepared for your coming. And thank you, Lord, that you help us and you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen.